Yes. yes. I'll roll. <laughs> when you turn it off. Good afternoon. My name is Lene Palmasano, and I'm the chair of Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Tuesday, April 12th. With me at the dais are almost all council members. I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Payne. Present. <coughs> Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Present. Council Member Rainville. Present. Council Member Vita. Present. Council Member Allison. Here. Council Member Osman. Present. Council Member Goodman. Present. President Jenkins. Council Member Chuktai. Present. Council Member Koski. Present. Council Member Johnson. Is absent. Say it. Is absent. Vice Chair Chavez. Present. Chair Palmasano. Present. That's 11 members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect. We have a quorum. Colleagues, we are going to use the, um, the Teams chat for speaker management, and I think you've had a, you have something at your desk showing how to sign in for that. So please bear with us, members in the audience, as we look to keep trying to make this go a little bit smoother with each successive meeting. But welcome back. Um, also, before we get started, a quick note that discussion of the items related to government structure, LIMS files 117 and 318 have been rescheduled to the next regular Committee of the Whole meeting on April 26th, as noticed. Uh, we have four items on the agenda today. Item four is a report relating to the city and county's joint strategy for responding to homelessness in the city of Minneapolis, and unfortunately, just this morning, we were notified that our co-presenter of this important topic from the county side will be unable to join us in chambers today. So we will need to remove that item from today's agenda, but look forward to it next time. So as such, I am going to move that we postpone this agenda item one cycle to April 26th. Is there a second? Second. Is there any questions or discussion? I want to note that we are still working on rescheduling with the county, and it's possible we need to, we will need to identify an alternate date. But um, for now, we're just postponing it one cycle. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. So now we have three items on today's agenda, and then reports of the committees that have met this cycle. I do want to welcome Council President, who's just joined us as well. Um, I'll begin with item one, the report on the contract awards or amendments that have been approved over the last couple of weeks by our ad hoc work group established for the American Rescue Plan Act related expenditures. Staff, as usual, does not have a presentation for this item today, but is on hand if colleagues have any questions. Not seeing any, I will direct the clerk to file that report. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a report from the ethics officer on ethics complaint item 2021-52. I understand that Mr. Wilcox will be reporting on this item in place of the ethics officer. Welcome, Mr. Wilcox. Wilcox, uh, and as the chair mentioned, I am uh, presenting this item in place of the ethics officer. This item concerns a complaint received by the ethics officer on September 16th of 2021, the complaint alleged that a city council member violated the Ethics in Government Code when he deleted a public post and all ensuing comments from the official City of Minneapolis Ward 4 Facebook page. The specific sections of the code applicable to the complaint are section 15.30, fiduciary duty, and section 15.100, city property and resources. The Ethical Practices Board first considered the complaint on November 16th of 2021 and determined the complaint was supported by probable cause. A hearing on the merits of the complaint was held on January 25th of 2022. Uh, the subject of the complaint through counsel was afforded the right to question witnesses, offer and scrutinize evidence, and present arguments before the board. The Ethical Practices Board admitted nine documentary exhibits and received sworn testimony from two witnesses, including now former Councilmember Cunningham 
At the conclusion of the hearing, the Ethical Practices Board deliberated on the matter and ultimately issued their findings and recommendations on February 11th of 2022. You each received a copy of their findings and recommendations prior to today's meeting. In general, uh, when an ethics violation involves a city council member, this body has a wide range of options. You have the ability to issue a written reprimand, adopt a resolution publicly acknowledging the violation and condemning the conduct. You could choose to strip the, uh, the council member of chairmanships um, or other assignments given by resolution. And if the circumstances warrant, uh, you could choose to remove the elected official pursuant to the process outlined in the city charter. You also have the ability to do nothing at all. In this case, the Ethical Practices Board is recommending you impose no discipline given the former council member's new status as a private citizen. Therefore, staff's recommendation to you today, consistent with the recommendations of the Ethical Practices Board, is to take no disciplinary action and administratively close this complaint. I'm happy to stand for questions, but I do understand uh, legal counsel uh, for Councilmember Cunningham would also like an opportunity to address your committee. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. I appreciate your brevity. I do plan to move the board's recommendation to us, um, but Ms. Carla Shelberg, representing former Councilmember Cunningham, if you would like to provide some brief comments, please um, Thank you. do so. I understand they'll be of a similar size, so maybe no more than two minutes. Thank you. I would ask that you not move the recommendation, and this is why. This, my name is Carla Shelberg. I represent Philippe Cunningham. The code of ethics is to protect the city from malfeasance, theft, self-dealing, bribery, dishonesty. Council Member Cunningham served honorably on this council. And there is nothing he did that constitutes malfeasance. Nothing. If you accept the finding, and it's just a factual finding and a recommendation to this council that he committed an ethical violation, the papers will report that as an ethical violation, and everyone will assume that he is guilty of theft, bribery, dishonesty, extortion. He will be grouped with the past council members that actually did commit those acts. What a gratuitous act of injustice that will follow him forever. It already has. Council member Cunningham removed a Facebook post a Facebook post that contained racial epitaphs and racial content. There is no justification at all for this ethics violation to be approved by this council or forwarded. Such a finding is contrary to the plain meaning of the code, its intent. Think about the intent. He was found guilty of destroying city property. He didn't destroy city property. That, those comments, that post are in the record of this case. He made it impossible to continue to comment on that post. That's all. That is not in any definition, clear or otherwise, a destruction of city property. It, such a finding is outside of the plain meaning, it is outside of the intent, it is outside the authority of the ethics board, and I will guarantee you that it will be appealed. Thank you, Ms. Schoberg. I, can I just finish? Please. Council spent a lot longer time than I am. I ask you to reject the recommendation of the Minneapolis Ethics Practice Board that Council Member Cunningham committed an ethical violation because he most certainly did not. And I have a letter that I hope has already been given to the Council. If not, I have copies. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schilberg, for your comments on this matter. I understand you have all received materials from Mr. Wilcox and have had an opportunity to ask him questions individually. 
Um, as mentioned earlier and to clarify, I would like to move to receive and file the report from the Ethical Practices Board, impose no discipline in this case, and administratively close ethics complaint number 2021-52. Is there a second? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Payne. No. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. No. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. No. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Nay. Councilmember Chugtai. No. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. No. Chair Palmasano. Aye. Pardon me, that's six yeas and six nays. So that motion fails, is my understanding, and I am happy to consider other motions accordingly or invite discussion from my colleagues. Are there any improvements to this motion that would help it to proceed? Council President. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm just curious from the attorney, is there an alternative solution that uh, former council member Cunningham is seeking? Um, I did want to keep our comments just for the rights of appeal focused on our city staff and city attorneys. Um, but I, I would invite you to ask that question of Mr. Wilcox. Is I that all right? Direct that question to Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Wilcox. This body obviously has leeway to uh, address this and, and modify uh, the, the motion in any way you see fit. Um, I, I would note that uh, this body has given, uh, pursuant to ordinance, the Ethical Practices Board, the uh, authority to make the factual findings. Uh, and so as it relates to the, the base level factual findings, this body through ordinance gave that authority to the Ethical Practices Board. Of course, the, the recommendations regarding discipline um, you know, is, is solely within your power. Um, but of course, you are well within your, your rights to modify uh, the, the recommendations uh, before you enact on that. Does that answer your question? And, and thank you, uh, President Jenkins. My understanding uh, from just from the, the, the procedural posture of the case is that um, former council member Cunningham wants there to be a finding that there was no ethical violation whatsoever. And um, that's, that's kind of the, the disconnect is the Ethical Practices Board reached their finding that, that there was um, a violation here. And um, that's, that's where the impasse is. Ah, now I'm seeing the queue here. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba and then Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, thank you both to our city attorneys and that uh, of the legal representation for our former council member Cunningham. Um, I absolutely understand kind of the justification with um, disagreeing with the ethics board decision. Um, I say that in a sense of, you know, the only justification for dismissing this complaint is based off of uh, Mr. Cunningham no longer being a, a council member um, and, a, and now a private citizen. But I also know just, you know, several weeks ago that residents deliver over a thousand uh, at this complaint against our current mayor that was dismissed without even um, as much of discussion that we're having about Mr. Cunningham's um, uh, case. And I find that very concerning. I find it sets a, a potential um, uh, precedence for a double standard where a black trans 
man elected official is held to a higher level of public scrutiny than a white elected official. And I believe the city needs to urgently rebuild trust and credibility with the public and to appear to be even handed and fair in our ethics process is going to be very, uh, very much a crucial component of that. So I just want to state my intention of why I'm not supporting that mo this uh, motion before us. Thank you. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, kind of elevate this conversation to the role social media has played just in our democracy. It is not the public square. Uh, we have Section 230 protections that allow platforms like Facebook to really decide what you see and you don't see. It, the news feed is not a, a, a replacement for the public square. Um, I know that some of the intentions behind our social media policy is to protect um, free speech. Uh, however, free speech does not apply to a private company. And I just, I, it doesn't sit well with me that we would establish a precedent that uh, managing a social media profile is the equivalent of destroying city property. And I think that what we really need to do is use this as a learning opportunity to actually further develop what our social media policy is, but also as a society, really reflect on the role that social media has played in our democracy. And I think that this is a, an insidious process to have our ethics complaint process weaponized against political dissent. And I know that the specifics of this case are, you know, don't seem to rise to that kind of occasion. And in fact, the specifics of this case makes me want to dismiss this outright because it was a kind of silly Facebook post that was deleted um, that wasn't particularly directly related to the campaign season. Um, and it did get into these heated back and forth with a bunch of constituents. And again, the way Facebook makes its money is through engagement and enragement equals engagement. And so it is not the public square. You are seeing a curated feed of your, when you're on Facebook, and it is elevating the most controversial content possible because that gets more clicks, which gets more ad revenue. So I don't like using an elected official as you know, a test case for how you can actually weaponize this ethics complaint process against your political enemies. And I just feel like we need to be really thoughtful about how we move forward with this. Councilmember Ellison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> uh, I yeah, I do want to affirm that uh, that Councilmember Cunningham did serve his time here ethically, and I don't and I don't think that this body should be uh, even taking action on on an item. Uh, it, it feels frivolous to me, and that's not. And that's and maybe that's a part of our process uh, and maybe that's a part of how we've written the ordinance and maybe we need to take a second look at that. Um, you know, if, if uh, I'm not even necessarily blaming the ethics board, if they followed the rules as they saw them, if staff followed the process as they saw it, then 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 that's fine. But I don't I cannot envision a world in which after the term that we had um, uh, that, that out of all of the conduct uh, 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 that we experienced in the last couple of years, that Councilmember Cunningham deleting this Facebook post was the worst one. That's what this action is, 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 is affirming. And so, uh, you know, if we need to delay this item until we can figure out what the what an appropriate action would be from this body, that I think that that's fine. If we could delete this item from the agenda and not take it up. Uh, I think that that would be fine. Um, if that's, if that's, uh, if that's a, if that's a, if that's a plausible, uh, direction for us to take, but, um, but I, I just can't imagine, uh, uh, continuing to sort of honor this and affirm this action, um, uh, by, by approving this here at committee. I don't even think this should be before us. So. Thank you, council member Ellison. I do want to clarify, um, this motion does not weigh in on the facts. This motion receives and files the report that was given to us and seeks to impose no discipline in this case. Um, if there, I guess I would invite the city attorney, Mr. Wilcox, to opine if you want to 
on whether or not um, we could make a motion to dismiss this because this is a report that was given to us and this report was in the full authority of that ethical practices board. We also have others in queue. Thank you, Chair Paul Masano. Uh, that is correct. We're here before this committee because the ordinance requires, upon the ethics um, board finding um, a sustained violation, the ordinance requires notification to the city council and mayor. So, so that's why we're here before you today. Um, statutory required to provide this notice. Uh, and uh, you know, as you mentioned, we aren't asking the council to make a factual finding stating yes, this was or was not a, a violation. We're simply asking you to uh, receive and file the report uh, that the Ethical Practices Board issued and imposed no discipline and, and administratively closed this matter. Um, once the, the matter is closed, then of, of course without discipline, uh, you know, it's our understanding uh, that the matter would be private personnel data uh, and, and that would um, you know, be, be the end of the process. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Th uh, thank you, Madam Chair. What's insidious is that we're suggesting that this is political. The ethics board is beyond reproach. I don't even know who the people are who serve on it, to be honest, and other than the fact that we see their applications, they're not people that have day-to-day -day experience with any of us. There are thousands of people who are um, subject to the city's ethics process. And I think it would be insidious for the city council to take one of our own and say, we don't think what the ethics board did was right and not do that for all of the other people who are covered under this ethics ordinance. Ultimately, this is a simple receive and file. I'm not sure who did and did not read the report, but it's about as clear as day that when using a city Facebook page, you cannot delete anything. Everyone knew that. That wasn't a secret. It, on your personal Facebook page, it's probably different. On your personal social media, it might or might not be different. But using the city's official channel, for whatever reason the ethics department has decided, you can't just put something up and then delete it. It's pretty cut and dry. And all we're being asked to do is to receive and file this. We're not asking, I don't believe they're asking us to find Councilmember Cunningham guilty. We're saying he's a private citizen, so it's not really applicable. But to be fair, it could be applicable to anyone here sitting on this dais right now who goes onto their city Facebook page, says something, and deletes it. So what seems scary to me is that we've turned a legitimate, impartial ethics panel, who I believe are generally beyond reproach, and saying that they're doing something wrong, and since it's against someone that we like, we're going to dismiss it. That's what seems insidious to me. And I hope that's not the path we continue to go down. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, question for our Assistant City Attorney. And when you first came up here, you did note that there is an opportunity for Council to bring maybe a substitute motion at a different time. I see. Chair Palmasano, you brought for one. Is there still space to amend, well, one, delay this item and make a substantive motion that could be more reflective of, I think, some of the concerns that's being raised here? That um, would be more a question for the city clerk. And yes, you are, since the previous motion failed on a six to six vote, you are welcome to make amendments or substitutions or any of those things. Do you have one now or should I come back? No, I'm asking if we can then delay this item so that we can bring forward that substitute I see. Motion. Yes, you could also make a motion to delay this until the next meeting. Okay. That's a unless, motion. I guess, maybe in light of what you just said, we should ask the city attorney, is there a deadline here that we are um, beyond? Um, it, from indication of a, of a head nod, it sounds like we could delay this one cycle and come back with um, an improved motion. That's correct, Chair Paul. Okay. Thank you. Council member, oh, sorry, are you? Yes. Does that answer? In yes, and then there's a motion, and I'm, that's the motion that I would like to put. Okay, so mm -hmm. Council member Wansley Warlaba would like to put forward a motion to delay this one cycle in efforts of bringing forward an improved yes. motion. Is there a second? Second. It has been seconded. Council member Payne. Uh, I got on cue just to say that um, 
it isn't actually that cut and dry. Uh, there are circumstances where you can delete uh, your Facebook posts. Uh, and I'm just, it sounds kind of silly, but to say it <laughs> about this topic, you can delete your Facebook posts. You have to check in with the social media manager. That is the policy. So there are conditions in which it is absolutely appropriate to delete a Facebook post. Um, and I think I just jumped in the queue to say that. I, I just think we should just delay this and have actually a more thoughtful um, resolution to this ethics violation. Uh, and I think there's something to be said about you know, following the statutory requirements and following the policy and then questioning whether or not uh, those statutory requirements or that policy needs to be revisited. And I hope that's something that we can at least explore in a future delay. Thank you. I am also supportive of, of a delay so that we can bring forward something that we can all agree on. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else in queue and I wanna move on to our next scheduled topics. Um, I guess not seeing any further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll on delaying this item one cycle. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Wansley Warlabaugh. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. <coughs> Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. No. President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. That's 10 yeas and two nays. Thank you. That motion passes and we will see this again on April 26th. Next to item three. Item three is a presentation on the development of our city's improvement plan following the 2020 civil unrest after action report. I will start by inviting Mr. Barrett Lane from the Office of Emergency Management, or maybe the city coordinator, Heather Johnson, <laughs> <laughs> to begin the presentation on this item. Welcome, coordinator. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council. Uh, Heather Johnston, the interim city coordinator, and I'm just here to give an introduction, and then I will turn it over to our director of the Office of Emergency Management, um, Mr. Lane. So um, we are here, as you indicated, to talk about the after action review. Um, that the city formally requested in February of 2021. The review was requested to provide an overview of the events in the days following George Floyd's murder, as well as the city's reaction and um, to that, uh, those events that happened. The scope did not cover any activities outside of the city agencies. I wanna make that very clear. And so there have been questions about um, external parties and that was not the subject of this, this review. Um, as you all know, the events during this time were unprecedented. Oops, sorry, I forgot to say next slide. Do I control it myself? Well, there you go, even worse. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we're, we're all getting, uh, we're learning here. Um, thank you. Um, so these, so the review covers May 25th through June 3rd of 2020. Um, the events, as I just mentioned, uh, during this time were unprecedented and unlike any other emergency responses the city had experienced. Um, as you all know, typically when we have emergency responses, um, it is something that is an event happens and then we respond and recover. Um, this was an event that was unlike that. Um, the after action review was limited to the operational response within city limits as well. And the city did begin uh, addressing shortfalls in the response uh, even before receiving the report. So what you will hear today is an update on what has been done to date. March 7th, 2022 is when the city received the report from Hillard Hines. There were 25 key findings as a part of that report and 27 recommendations for follow-up. In this presentation, we've grouped the recommendations according to different city departments in order to facilitate that conversation. Many of the re recommendations have been started and some have been completed. So you will get the status update of those at this point in time. Um, it is really important that we communicate to the community what we've done in response to the, the events of that period in time. Um, we have had other after action reviews and we wanna be very clear and transparent 
with everyone, including the council, about how we've responded and the changes that we've made um, in response to what we've learned. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Barrett Lane, our Director of the Office of Emergency Management. Thank you. Welcome, Director Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council Members. Uh, Barrett Lane, I'm the Director of the Office of Emergency Management. Um, as we approached this work, we basically started with the report and developed some strategies on how we're going to approach this, this work as we go forward. So the first step we did was we gathered up the department heads that uh, own this work and, and the partners that are part of it, and we formed this Emergency Management Advisory Committee. The committee's job is basically to oversee the development and then the implementation of this uh, interdepartmental effort that will respond to the after action review and uh, complete the improvement plan. We then took the findings and the recommendations in the report and broke them down into two big uh, bundles of work, if you will. The greater weight of the report has to do with the implement implementation of the incident command system and the national incident management system. We had some training with the council a couple of weeks ago about this. So, uh, I know you're familiar with it, but I will, as we go through here, st stop and define some terms so that folks who are listening uh, will know what we're talking about here. The greater weight of the report and, in fact, many of the recommendations and findings have to do with simply implementing the incident command system or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to put together that entire basket of work and we're going to treat it as a unit. We're going to reset our National Incident Management System commitment and our commitment to the Incident Command System across the various components that uh, we've discussed in the past. And I will uh, touch on that a little bit more in a moment. The goal of this will be to demonstrate, it will be to demonstrate the proficiency that we wanted to see during 2020. So we are going to reboot the system and then we are going to make sure that in an exercise, a rigid, rigid, rigid rigorous, exercise uh, that we can demonstrate those capabilities. So that's going to be the strategy associated with a good deal of this work. The other thing, the other bundle of work, if you will, is sort of the department level work. There's a number of things here that relate to uh, policies, procedures, or practices that are owned by one department or primarily one department. And we have tasked that out to the department heads for individual follow-up. So the presentation today is going to follow these two components. We'll talk first about the incident command system reset, and then we'll turn it over to uh, my colleagues to talk about the status of the various uh, department level recommendations that have been made, including what work has been done up until now. So we'll be getting a sense of how we're going to be going forward. As we learned during the training, the National Incident Management System is the system that we use to respond to emergencies. This council committed to us to that path in 20, uh, 2005. So this is, this is a commitment that we have made. And ultimately, that system is intended to frame how we plan for and respond to emergencies of all sizes, of all hazards, um, across different departments, and across different sectors. It applies to the public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector. It is the system that we're supposed to be using and obviously was the primary thrust of the after action report. If you think back to the presentation that we had during training, there are four components of this system that are key uh, for the findings in the report and ultimately going forward here. One has to do with the incident command system. So a lot of these terminology sounds similar, and that's why I want to just take a second and, and pause to make sure that we're oriented to this. So the National Incident Management System is the framework that contains the next four components on that slide. The incident management system is how tactical responders in the field organize themselves to respond. Police officers, firefighters, public health workers, public works workers, if they're working an incident using the incident management system, then they are using this incident command system that prescribes a structure and a planning process that they're to go through. The emergency operations center is the second component that we're going to be looking at. That is OEM's responsibility, and that is the city's primary coordination function. We do not take over command. We support incident command in the field by filling resource requests and managing information 
and providing additional authority. The EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, is that vehicle by which we as a whole enterprise focuses our support on incident command activities. The third component on the list is the multi-agency coordination group. And this really is the, the, the group or the place where the policymakers interface with the system. So whether it's the mayor or the city council through the MAT multi-agency coordination group or what we've called the policy group, we've talked about those systems in the past, but that's the interface with the elected officials. And then lastly, the joint information system or the joint information center, if there's a physical uh, center stood up, is the public affairs and external affairs element that covers all of these things. These are all interlocking components, and uh, if you go through the report, uh, not only does each component have some findings, but the interface and fit and finish between the components uh, have some uh, response there as well. If you look at this graphically, and you'll recall this slide from our training, most of the uh, incidents that we are responding to are on the left side of the screen. It is incident command in the field, or sometimes unified command. That's when two different organizations with legal responsibility to manage an incident come together. That needs to, and obviously that's something that we need to look at through the lens of this report. But also on the right side is the, is the support system for those teams out in the field. That MAC group, the jurisdictional EOC, the joint information system. It's our intent to reboot this entire system, to go through the plans, the organizational structures, the training, and make sure that all of that is in line and that we can actually set ourselves up to execute these systems as designed. And we will show that in a series of tests and exercises that will lead us to a capstone exercise in the future. I'm not gonna go through all of these. These are all of the findings that touch on either the National Incident Management System or the Incident Command System. You can see that uh, there are a number of them. And here are the specific recommendations that have to do with that command and coordination function that we just discussed. So again, I'm not gonna get into the details of this, we're bundling this so that we can, we can manage the work more efficiently toward a end state objective as opposed to simply re, uh, responding to what are essentially symptoms of the problem rather than the problem itself. Here's the end state we wanna to get to. This comes right out of FEMA's documentation as far as what we're expected to be able to do. And really all this says is that we use these systems as designed. So these are the end states that we're going to be working for, and our objective is to be able to show that we can do these four things by the time we're done with this project. We are proposing to have a capstone exercise, which should be the end state of this. Uh, we are asking FEMA, and the mayor has directed us to apply for a FEMA, that's the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Integrated Emergency Management course. These courses were fundamental in the success of the bridge collapse that was, mented, or was mentioned in the report. Uh, and we are going to be using the same mechanism to bring us back to that course. So uh, just to be clear though, this is not a light lift. This is a huge expectation on behalf of this organization. We're talking about sending 60 people at various levels of the organization uh, out to four days of training and two days of travel. Um, but the, the, the advantage of this is that we would be able to, again, demonstrate our capabilities in a forum that we have been in before. And I've participated in two of these things, and I can just, as a represent, as someone who's gone through them, they are extraordinarily worthwhile as far as testing and demonstrating capabilities. The earliest we can get application for would be a 2024 course. So we will put the application in, we will learn early next year if we are in fact accepted and if we are, we'll keep driving on. But if not, uh, we'll go to a plan B and we'll know whether we have to have a contractor to put together a similar exercise. But that is, I think, really a, a, a second choice here. Having, having this happen within the FEMA system and bringing it back to that level, I think is gonna add a lot of value to the city as a whole. And with that, that's, that's really, in a nutshell, how we intend to deal with what I would call the greater weight of this report, that reset of the incident command system and its components in the national incident management system in such a way that we can demonstrate the proficiency that you all in the public expect us to be able to show. So I will pause there before we get into department level projects, 
or I can drive on, um, Madam Chair, as you will. The way I'd like to handle this is just to pause periodically and then after each of the department heads has their uh, update to see if there are any questions from my colleagues. Are there any at this point in time, either through the flag system or the chat? Council President. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Director uh, Lane. Is the training, the, is it Mount Hood or what's it called? The training that you referenced? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question through the chair. I haven't asked my question yet. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, is the training that you described, is that a recommendation from the report? So the training that we've already done, the two training sessions that the council has had, were things that the report recommended that we do, but we were doing those things anyway. We train the council every four years, um, and we came back through that cycle just as this was coming together. So it just, I think it's sort of happenstance that we had just discussed these things a couple of weeks ago, and now we're kind of back at a practical aspect of it. So the training that we've been doing uh, supports this program, and again, we're on the same four-year council cycle uh, to make sure that you see that once, uh, once a cycle. The recommendation and the improvement plan item for us will be to make sure that we do that on a, uh, at least an annual uh, up a refresher training basis, which we're certainly willing to do. Certainly. So my question was, and I was trying to clarify, the title of the 60-person, four-day training that you were referring to. I don't know if it's Mount Hood or Mount Weather or something to that effect, but is that part of the recommendations? Yes. So that's not specifically recommended in the, the report, but that's our staff recommendation as, as to provide a, a definitive end state to work toward and a way of demonstrating the capabilities that we hope to build in the meantime. So it's not in the report per se, this is our recommendation as to how we wrap up, if you will, the work that needs to be done in the meantime in a demonstrative way. Thank you. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Lane. Um, my recollection from the after action report was that we actually had a pretty strong emergency operations plan and that that plan wasn't followed. And I was just curious to know if this additional FEMA training is going to speak directly to that disconnect between our plans and how we actually execute it on the ground. Madam Chair, Council Member, yes. If we're approved for this program, part of their process is to sit down with us and go through all of our plans and procedures because that's what ultimately we want to exercise. So the emergency operations plan will be part of that. And I'm going to skip ahead in my slide here. We're bringing that next version of that plan back to you all. Again, this is something that we have on an ongoing basis uh, in the next month. So you should have that document itself and the next version of it in front of you for your consideration by mid-May. So the answer to your question is yes, we'll be working with the emergency operations plan. I'm not seeing anybody else in queue at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council members, uh, since I have the floor, I'm just going to speak briefly to what uh, OEM has been tasked out to do individually. Uh, we talked about the council and executive cycle uh, of training. That's something that is specifically called out in the report, and that's something that we will have complete by June. Again, this is something that we've been doing on an ongoing basis, um, uh, on a four-year basis, uh, independent of whether the AAR came through or not. But I think the annual refresher training that they're recommending is an excellent ideal, and we'll be back with that next year. And just parenthetically, because of the off-cycle elections that are coming up for the council, we will come back with the same training for that new council uh, following that election in a couple years. So we will take care of that piece as well. After action reporting is something that we've been asked to accomplish in OEM. That's not generally been our role as far as enterprise-wide after-action reporting, but we certainly have the capability to do that, and uh, I believe that that will be ultimately the mayor's direction. So we're prepared to simply take on the after-action reporting recommendation that they uh, have in the report. We either do that with our in-house resources or we'd manage a contract depending on the size of the after-action report. So that, I think, is largely taken care of. 
The training and exercises recommendation will be taken care of as part of the overall NIMS refresh that we just talked about. We are already doing a gap analysis to look at our training plans to make sure that the plans all meet standards. We know who needs to be trained, who has been trained, when was the last time they were trained. So we're doing that gap analysis right now so that we can uh, put the rest of the training plan together. So that is also well in hand. The last component here is uh, public protective actions with respect to civil disorder. And this was, I think, again, a really good point that was raised in the AAR. We actually developed recommendations prior to the Chauvin trial and uh, ran them through the communications department. So some of that information was actually deployed. We are updating those um, recommendations now, and we will be bringing those next set of recommendations back through the emergency management uh, committee that I just discussed for further action. It's going to be a, an interesting discussion with respect to how are we going to treat uh, some of the uh, grassroots act action that took place during these events and how are we going to work with that. But our, particularly with respect to groups that are assembling to, to um, keep an eye on property and, and elements like that. So um, we will be bringing that component forward as well. And then just as a flag here, uh, we will have that emergency operations plan back to you for your May 12th council meeting. I believe that those briefings are on your calendar already. And if they aren't, they will land there very shortly. And then the last component, it's like two years worth of work here for, for a, in the morning's presentation, uh, we will be bringing those policy group recommendations back to you so that we make sure that you have that interface that we talked about during the training. And that is all I have, Madam Chair. I will pause there if you have questions specifically for me. Otherwise, I will turn it over to the interim chief, who I believe is next up. Just taking a quick scan for questions that aren't in the queue. Not seeing any. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Welcome, Chief Huffman. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, council members. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this afternoon. I'm Amelia Huffman, the interim chief for the Minneapolis Police Department, and I have a handful of slides to go over with you as well, um, as well as then taking any questions that you might have about our remediation plants. All right, so <clears throat> the first uh, point on the first slide references the content that Director Lane was describing. Minneapolis Police Department is in full alignment with the plan that was just described to you to reset the department's commitment to NIMS and to the incident command structure. Um, as Chief Tyner will describe, we have trained many of our personnel over the years um, through the entire series of ICS courses. However, like many police agencies, the shift in our training over time has been away from repeating those training courses. And so some of our folks have not been to ICS training or have not had a refresher ICS training in many years. And so updating all of that training will be part um, of the work that Director Lane has described. Recommendation four, workforce analysis and leadership training. Workforce analysis is actually a human resources function. Um, so we are in discussion with human resources to determine um, what services they can provide to the department for a workforce analysis. Um, the leadership development work is, of course, ongoing as it is in every part of the city enterprise. Um, currently, we have a knowledge, skills, and abilities-based promotional process. Um, that's also managed overall uh, by human resources. We use an outside vendor to create the components for that promotional process um, where we promote sergeants, um, and lieutenants. The vendor is IO Solutions, it's a group of industrial psychologists. Um, they prepare a written test based on the contract, department policies, and other sorts of reading materials that we identify as important for our personnel to understand. Um, and then they also um, develop the components for and run an assessment center where our candidates for promotion um, display their skills um, in a scenario-based series of exercises. And then the final component of that promotional process is an interview um, with the chief and uh, other staff from the chief's office. 
We will be investing in additional training and leadership development opportunities. Of course, for many years, we have used career enrichments um, as one way to develop our personnel um, to expand their understanding of different roles within the department. These are typically short-term rotations uh, where officers um, spend time away from an assignment in patrol, uh, usually for about 90 days, um, to work in another area of the department, either in investigations, training, or other kinds of administrative functions, um, to better understand how the parts of the department work together, um, and to get an understanding of what role they might take on if they were to seek promotion. We are also looking at creating some intentional developmental assignment rotations as pathways to leadership. Um, this has a, been a project that I have um, long thought that the department would benefit from, um, so we are in the process of building out what that would look like. Um, these would be longer term intentional rotations for personnel who display uh, promising leadership abilities and are interested in a pathway to promotion, um, and uh, it would be very intentional stretch assignments where folks would have an opportunity to do work very different from what their normal assignment would be. Right now we are in the planning phases for that. The implementation will be some ways off because unfortunately our ability to execute that um, is right at the intersection of our current staffing crisis, uh, which makes implementation of those kinds of projects much more difficult. We're in the process of redesigning our new supervisor training curriculum. So this is the um, formal training and mentorship opportunities that folks undergo when they're promoted to sergeant or lieutenant roles. Uh, we're working with the city's HR leadership and um, development group uh, to include some components like Agile Manager, which many of you may be familiar um, as a training program that the city offers throughout the city enterprise, as well as experiences and training content that's specific to law enforcement. We do have a consultant engaged in collaboration with FIRE um, as they are also interested in redesigning their supervisory uh, curriculum. We are also bringing in ongoing training courses provided by the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Association. They have three-level program um, where we will be providing opportunities yearly for our folks at various levels of supervisory and management assignments to take advantage of this high quality training that's provided to law enforcement agencies throughout the country. Um, and we are in discussion about leadership succession plans. Um, this of course has also been um, you know, made much more difficult by the current staffing crisis. Um, having lost over 300 sworn officers over the past 20 months, um, we've lost a tremendous amount of experience, skill, and capacity. Uh, and so we are in ongoing discussions about the best way to intentionally develop folks for future leadership positions. Recommendation six, the civil disturbance policy. This is policy 7-805. The main points of the policy as it stands now are that officers shall not interfere with lawful protests or demonstrations, and that they're responsible for keeping the peace unless a crime is committed. That policy language is currently under review to ensure that it reflects industry best practices as well as department values. Um, so that work has not been done yet, but that work is underway. Recommendation 10, this is around less lethal munitions. Um, we have made many updates since June of 2020 to policies related to less lethal munitions. As you can see from this timeline, beginning in June of 2020, there have been updates to these policies all the way through March of 2021. The highlights are that we created an authorization process for the use of crowd control weapons only with the authorization by the chief or the designee at deputy chief level or higher. We've restricted the carrying and use of 40 millimeter launchers during civil disturbances or assemblies related to protests and demonstrations to train SWAT officers unless the chief or the chief's designee at deputy chief level or higher approves the carrying by other trained officers. This would be in a circumstance where um, there may be multiple um, sites of uh, unrest across the city um, and we don't have SWAT capability for every location. Uh, and so the chief or the chief's designee would then have the um, ability to approve um, the deployment of the 40 millimeter launchers by other trained officers. And we've also updated definitions, reporting, and documentation requirements throughout those policies. Recommendations 11, 12, and 19. 
Recommendation 11, leadership over continuity of services, was fairly straightforward, um, and we have identified um, that we will be using command level staff at the inspector level um, to oversee the activities not related to any kind of um, civil unrest or disturbance incident, uh, but the police activities that are taking place in the rest of the city during any kind of an incident. Recommendation 12, civil unrest resource planning. Um, following the civil unrest, uh, the MPD and Public Works have instituted a collaborative process to identify um, the resources and infrastructure necessary for uh, protecting the precincts and other kinds of city buildings. Um, and you'll be very familiar with that as you have seen that, um, particularly during the trial time period when that kind of infrastructure protection was deployed in many locations around the city. And recommendation 19 related to camera control, this one was um, identified in the after action report um, as being an OEM responsibility, but this is actually um, MPD because MPD um, does manage those milestone cameras that are throughout the city. Um, and we have recently released a policy cited here, 4-225, that addresses the control of the public safety cameras and makes it clear that in the event that we have an incident like this where we have a command post in operation, um, the incident commander at the command post has priority for the control of those cameras. If we have a smaller incident that's being managed at a precinct level, um, then the control of those cameras is managed by the incident commander at the precinct level. And then recommendations 22, 24, and 25. Um, the first one, 22, is about crowd control training. Um, crowd control training um, has already been implemented. Um, that is part of our yearly in-service package that we do for all of our staff, as well as for employees who serve as part of our mobile field force. That's a secondary assignment. So as part of that secondary assignment, um, then they do get annual mobile field force training. Um, and actually, the 2022 in-service package is being delivered right now. All personnel in the department are going through um, that yearly training related to crowd control and working with uh, the mobile field force. We've also used the patrol online training, which I think many of you have been familiar with because you've heard about it in other training presentations related to MPD, but this is content that's developed by the League of Minnesota Cities um, for law enforcement agencies around the state, um, and they do have a training module related to protest management, which we have also um, used for all of our sworn staff. Recommendation 24, employee wellness. We have a request for proposals that's in the final stage. Um, I expect that it will be going to procurement uh, possibly as early as next week um, to identify some a vendor for comprehensive wellness services. Um, that would be a significant investment and improvement over the wellness services that we have had available for our employees to date. Our existing wellness services um, include um, a wellness app um, that has information about specific wellness topics. It has a list of our peer support team members um, who have volunteered to provide peer support around certain kinds of topics. Um, and it also has contact information in the app that's accessible for mental health professionals who work specifically with law enforcement. Um, so it makes it very easy for our folks to be able to find that information and reach out. Um, we have a an MPD wellness team, which is a small group of employees who help to coordinate these services um, and help to um, respond to referrals, to reach out to employees, to make sure that we connect them with the resources that they need, whether it's mental health or another kind of a wellness service. Um, and we also have mental health providers that we contract with for things like pre-service screening, fitness for duty evaluations, and critical and traumatic incident debriefings. Um, and then we have other services that aren't listed on the, on the slide here, um, but community-based resources, of course, um, and the chaplains who work with MPD who can provide a great deal of emotional support to employees as well. And then recommendation 25, investigation surge capacity. Um, this is specifically related to the ability to um, handle um, triage intake and begin investigations for complaints that are received during periods of civil unrest related to allegations of police misconduct. Um, and as I've noted on this slide here, um, there is the ability in the city to provide increased surge capacity. The city attorney's office does manage the contract with outside services. Um, we don't have the ability inside the police department to identify additional internal affairs investigators during that period of time. Um, and likewise, the Office of 
Police Conduct Review, um, which ultimately is the umbrella um, for the city's response to allegations of police misconduct, misconduct, pardon me, um, also has a, a limited amount of staffing, but we do have that ability for surge capacity managed through the city attorney's office. All right, and with that, I will be happy to take any questions or turn it over to Chief Tyner of the Fire Department. Thank you. Are there any questions for Chief Huffman? We'll start with Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chief. Um, I have a kind of structural question, I guess, to our response to these recommendations. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the best way to frame it. And so I'm just thinking in terms of, so we don't, we all read the report, we need to change things. So my question is, you know, based on what unfolded on the ground, was this an issue of policy and training? And so does that mean we either didn't have policies in place or training in place, or we need to change our policies or change our training? But I think, so that's like one component of my question. And then another component of my question is, in the event that we did have policies and training in place and they weren't followed, how do we best um, respond to that instance? So it's kind of like a two-part question. Did we have policies and training in place that just weren't followed? Or do, was it more issue of we didn't actually have a solid understanding of crowd, crowd control and now we need to create that new type of training? Thank you for the question, council member. Uh, I think that it's a, it's a complicated answer to that question. Um, like many police agencies and like you've heard from others today, you know, these incidents were unprecedented in their size and scope um, in the amount of um, violence uh, and in behavior like looting and arson that we had not seen on this particular scale before in Minneapolis. Uh, that's certainly true not only for this agency but police agencies around the country. If you read after action reports that have been completed in many cities, um, you'll see that these themes are quite common, um, that it's a combination of all of the things that you have described. Um, so there had been a gap in a number of years uh, since we had invested in doing NIMS and incident command training for our personnel. Um, some folks had undergone the entire series of ICS training, um, but it had been many years before. Um, other personnel had not received ICS training at all. Um, our policies are um, a constantly evolving project. Uh, we are working to um, invest and update uh, in those policies based on changing best practices um, in the profession all of the time. Um, so we certainly have work to do and have done much work around our crowd control policies, um, and that work continues continues. Um, and then uh, the situation on the ground was complicated and complex for our personnel. Um, and under those circumstances, the policies that we did have in place were imperfectly followed. Um, and some of those issues have been addressed um, and will be addressed in the future um, with changes in supervision, training, and updates to policy. Um, there have been also some um, misconduct cases, of course, that have been generated by those incidents that happened um, during this period of time in 2020 that have been working their way forward through the system. Um, a small number of those cases have come to their conclusion, but there are others in that system as well. And, and then as a follow-up, yeah, definitely understanding the complexity of this. If you were to have to weigh you know, one as being the heavier lifts over, over the other, would you say it's updating our training and policies is the heavier lift, or is it making sure that we're managing to our training and policies? Thank you for the question. Um, I don't think that you can, you can frame for the other, um, for this issue or many others. The reality is that if we want to provide the best possible service to all of our stakeholders in Minneapolis, we need to ensure that we have good policies, that we're providing our folks with excellent training, that we're investing in their capacity to do their work, that we're providing the appropriate level of support at every level of the police department, including the kind of um, emotional and wellness support that's been um, described here, um, and that we hold people accountable when there are failures. None of those things is more important than any of the other because it is an ecosystem that every part of has to work together to get the outcome that we want. Thank you. Councilmember Koski. Uh, thank you, 
Madame uh, and Chief Huffman, uh, in reference to slide uh, titled MPD R6, the civil disturbance policy, can you speak to the process that will be put in place to review the policy language to ensure it reflects industry best practices, uh, but specifically who will be involved in this process and are there any partners external to MPD uh, that will be involved in that process? Thank you for the question. Um, so our policy review process um, generally includes uh, research as its first component. Um, and so in order to calibrate what industry best practices are, um, we look to organizations like the Police Executive Research um, Forum, International Association of Chiefs of Police, the major city chiefs, um, and we look at work that's being done uh, by other major metropolitan police departments um, to calibrate what the policy language is that is the best practice that we're coalescing around. Um, we also certainly are looking at any number of after action reports um, and, the, and the responses that have come from those after action reports in other cities. Um, we put all of that research together um, and then we talk with folks um, who are stakeholders of various kinds. Um, so you folks oftentimes are part of that conversation. Um, the mayor's office as well, external community partners um, in coalescing around what the final policy language is like, particularly for um, a complicated piece of policy like this. Um, that review will include any number of people um, as well as folks at the city attorney's office. Thank you, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Chief Hoffman. Just a couple uh, questions that I have. So um, I think it's important to, to raise the fact and highlight that the after action report that was done in the wake of 2015 when Jamar Clark was killed, uh, many of the recommendations that um, was proposed in that after action was very similar to the one that we received just, you know, two months ago. Um, and what we've seen as a correlation between the two is that implementation, as I think Council Member Kane has kind of raised a couple of times, the implementation was just unsuccessful in, in both accounts of what was already established at some of these recommendations. So I'm interested to know if, you know, seeing so many of the same failures from 2015 and 2020 have you or MPD leadership done some type of investigation or analysis to understand exactly why recommendations back in 2015 going into 2020 were not implemented. Um, I raise this question because I worry that if we are not identifying the barriers that apparently limit um, successful and effective uh, execution of identified recommendations at that point, that we're setting ourselves up again to fail to implement them, and hopefully there's not a future incidence. Unfortunately, I've been there in 2015, tear gas in 2020. Um, we'll hope that no one else has to endure that because of another police-related murder in the future. So we'd like to know what type of analysis you're doing internally to get a sense of, you know, time <laughs> comparison. What are we doing to make sure we're not repeating the failures of 2015, of 2020 as well? Thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, I think that that's an, an excellent question. Um, I'm certainly familiar with the um, after action report from 2015, as I know many of you are as well. Um, unfortunately, I think as we look at the recommendations, not only for the police department, but for the city enterprise as a whole, there are any number of um, gaps and failures uh, that we would identify today. Um, for the police department specifically, um, our ability to follow through not only in this particular area, um, but on implementation of new policies and programs in general um, will be significantly bolstered by the fact that um, I'm creating an internal quality assurance function. We do not currently have this now. Um, with the hiring of two civilian um, law enforcement auditors, uh, those positions um, will be posted very shortly. They're in the final stages um, of the human resources process. Um, and that will help us not only in this particular area, but across the police department with ensuring that we're getting the outcomes that we're striving for. Um, and I'm also, you raised this too, um, in terms of accountability. I'm very interested in, um, if it's yourself, who are in charge and making sure that there's continuous execution of these measures. I know you, you named that um, in terms of timelines for implementation of these newer recommendations um, can't be defined due to staffing challenges. And I would say that's another point to look at in regards to 2015 where we didn't have similar staffing challenges and we still 
failed to implement many of these uh, recommendations, but looking at what are you imagining um, and even in this succession plan, um, laying out what are some clear metrics for accountability and implementing this, these, these recommendations, and when they're not, what could possibly you know, happen in response to that? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, as Director Lane um, mentioned uh, during his description of the work that we had ahead of us, these are long-term projects. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking at this retraining, implementation of NIMS, um, upgrade of policies, creation of new training programs, um, you know, in terms of years rather than months. Um, so this is not the kind of work that's going to be done in three months or six months. There will certainly be components of it um, that are continually moving forward and miles stones that we're reaching. Um, and I know that we have made a commitment um, as staff to come back and provide updates on this uh, progress for reaching those milestones. And so certainly you will be hearing um, about the progress that's been made. Um, but just to realistically set expectations, this is not the kind of um, training and development that rolls out in three months or six months. You know, we're talking about 2024 before we get to this capstone exercise related to um, our ability to have this final exercise to demonstrate proficiency in ICS. Um, so there is a lot of work ahead of us. And also thinking going back to because unfortunately we've had to deal with the case for instance Jalil Stalins where there are officers that have been named in particularly not um, following these policies again just thinking of those who have been identified as not in compliance with these policies what are existing or what has happened around accountability in regards to those officers and I think again setting the tone specifically for the officers like that misconduct when there's not compliance of these trainings. Of course, I think you, Council Member Payne laid out, it's very clear, the trainings and what happens on the ground, there's a disconnect, but knowing if you're on the ground, you're not in compliance, there's gonna be X, Y, Z accountability measures and it'll be good for me to get a sense, I didn't get that in a prior response of like, some more specificity of what that X, Y, Z could be. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, sort of the long process for those complaint investigations um, and then the outcome. Um, I believe many of you are pr probably familiar with the, the work that the Office of Police Conduct Review does, um, but that is generally the mechanism for those cases to proceed forward um, from the complaint intake um, through the Police Conduct Review Panel um, and then to my office for a final discipline decision. Um, once a discipline decision is made, if discipline um, is imposed by the chief, once it reaches final disposition status, so the discipline has been imposed and the grievance period has passed with no grievance, or discipline has been imposed and there was a grievance, but the grievance was resolved either with a settlement or with arbitration. Once we reach that status, the discipline decisions are posted on the city website, and so that information becomes public. So prior to that point when discipline hasn't reached final status, I'm not permitted to discuss the specifics of those cases because of the law. Do we have any, in regards to officers who participated in not non-compliance with, you know, the after action review or existing policies back in 2020, are there any of those cases that are currently public and, and basically giving a total number of what those finalized cases are right now? Do you have a sense of that? So there's been a very small number that have reached um, through the end of 2021 mm -hmm. to former Chief Arredondo's desk for a decision. Um, some are still in that process. Of the ones that did reach the former chief for a discipline decision, not all of them have reached final disposition status. Um, and so when you look at the public decisions on the city website, I believe that you will only find one memo that has been made public related to um, the period of time during the riots. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else with questions or comments at this time? Not seeing any. Thank you for your time, Chief. Thank you. Passing this along to Chief Tyner. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Promisano and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Brian Tyner. I am the fire chief for the Minneapolis Fire Department. Uh, let's see if I can get us back to where we were, or where we should be. There we go. All right, so 
I'm just going to cover three uh, pretty quick items. One is uh, NIMS ICS. The other is our recommendation for span of control. And the third will be our recommendation for resource tracking. <clears throat> so before we talk about NIMS and ICS, I want to just do a little background. So uh, NIMS training consists of the following certifications, and six of the eight are really pertinent for firefighters and first responders. Uh, those trainings are ICS 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, and 800. Notice there's a pattern there. So, <laughs> so uh, FEMA requires all firefighters to be trained and certified on ICS 100, 200, 700, and 800. And so all of our Minneapolis firefighters uh, complete those required certifications prior to even leaving uh, fire, the Fire Cadet Academy. In other words, upon graduation, they have all of those certifications. And so every Minneapolis firefighter has 100, 200, 700, and 800. But FEMA also re recommends that chief officers be trained and certified in ICS 300 and 400. So most of our chief officers have completed the ICS 300 and 400 training, but we do have some newer chiefs that still need to complete that training, and we're actually in the process of getting those chiefs uh, scheduled for that training uh, now, so they should have it soon. <clears throat> the recommendations regarding span of control were actually identified through us by our own after-action processes uh, after the civil unrest. And we made adjustments to that span of control policy uh, in advance of the Derek Chauvin trial. So the things that we identified and the adjustments we made were one, to ensure that the fire chief or his designee are physically present within the unified command structure. That was one of the big things that came out of this recommendation. Uh, also to ensure the chief officers are assigned to the multi-agency command and to the Minneapolis Emergency Communications Center. And we actually did have both of those in place um, <clears throat> during the civil unrest, but all three of those things need to occur. The big part of Spanish con of control is to ensure that Spanish control does not exceed the optimum number of four to six personnel or direct reports at any level of the incident. In other words, uh, every supervisor, every captain, every commander should have no more than four to six people uh, reporting to them to include even the fire chief. And we have committed to expand the incident com command system uh, as required to maintain that optimal span of control. So uh, if the incident calls for more people, then we've committed to expanding it to make sure that we don't lose that optimum span of control, which means more captains, more chiefs, whatever, whatever it is we need. <clears throat> Excuse me, whatever it is we need to include mutual aid. Uh, resource tracking, this one actually uh, confused me a bit uh, because we actually did track our resources during the incident. Uh, resource tracking is the primary function of the chief officer assigned to MECC, uh, and you might note in the, later in the report that it does uh, state in there that we did have chief officers down in MECC uh, during the civil unrest, in, including myself on the overnight shifts. Uh, resource tracking occurs 24-7 for us and it did in fact occur throughout the civil unrest. The tracking of resources is accomplished through the computer-aided dispatch system that we use here uh, in the city of Minneapolis. That system util utilizing GPS uh, provides us with resource tracking on every MFD apparatus in the city, <clears throat> and it includes their location, uh, it includes their status and availability, it includes incident updates and any communications that may have been uh, radio to dispatch and back. It includes uh, the response times to get to the scene and also the time that a rig is on scene. So again, we know where the rig is, how long it's been there, how long it took to get there, uh, what its availability is and what it's doing. It also includes a lot of other information. I think that's all I have. Yeah, I did say three quick ones. So with that, I will stand for questions. Thank you. Taking a look at the queue and just looking at my colleagues, um, Chief, one of your first your first slide talked about the 100, 200 through 800 level training. Can you help us understand what the 300 and 400 levels are and why that's applicable to chiefs? 
Yes, thank you. So, uh, Chair Palmasano, ICS 300 and 400 is uh, a higher level of ICS and it's really designed for incident command and being able to uh, be in control of larger incidents such as uh, the civil unrest. So, <clears throat> 100, 200, and 7 and 800 uh, give us that basic level of command that we use for all of our incidents. 300 and 400 really speak to the larger incidents and, and the larger uh, grouping or the larger command system that it takes to manage those. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions for you right now. Um, I think if we have a chance to digest this, maybe we'll have some additional ones. Thank you for Absolutely. your time. Absolutely, I'm always available. Thank you. I think next we're gonna hear from Director Bergstrom from Communications. Welcome, Director. Thank you, good afternoon, Chair Palmasano, Council Members. Uh, my name is Greta Bergstrom and I am the uh, Director of City Communications. Um, I also served as the lead public information officer um, uh, leading the joint information system uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the civil unrest that unfolded. The Communications Department uh, did stand up a virtual joint information system, and we have a diagram here kind of explaining the ins and outs of that. Um, we stood this up the day after Memorial Day on May 26th, uh, 2020. The joint information system established four sections. Uh, those were info, information gathering, um, media relations, uh, information products and community relations. I wanna make sure to um, give credit to our partners in neighborhood and community relations who really served as the assistant uh, PIOs and anchors um, for the community relations section. We work really closely with NCR. As communications NCR um, and our external partners had operated in a JIC and GIS formations for Super Bowl 52, for uh, the final four, and then at that time uh, during the pandemic, for the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a virtual GIS at that time handling health and public information there. We were pretty well practiced um, in the operations of a joint information system, at least internally. Um, the after action report by Hillard Hines did provide two recommendations uh, specific to the communications department. The first recommendation, recommendation uh, 13, speaks to the need for the city to develop a citywide crisis communications plan to keep the public informed about the city's response to a crisis. This would include various potential scenarios and operating multiple channels for any such response. That would include social media, uh, the city's website, internal communications briefings, external media briefings and the sort to keep the public informed. Um, I will say that communications really will continue to employ use of the JIC model and the NIMS um, compliance system for any crisis response in the future. Um, that's really the anchor of how we respond to um, a crisis, especially of that scale. We will continue to train our staff on NIMS and ICS we will conduct exercises to test and enhance the operational capabilities of the joint information system and make sure to work to close any gaps that are identified. Um, this is inclusive of the community relations section, um, which does provide the direct outreach and information sharing to the community, including translation uh, services as well of messages. And we will test how the JIC or GIS um, works um, with the broader system so again, those interlocking parts that um, Director Lane mentioned, uh, including the EOC, the policy group, et cetera. We are working internally right now to develop a social media critical incidents and hazard plan to have pre-approved content ready to deploy for various crisis incidents. That would be through social media. The goal is to not be silent on social media in the initial hours of a crisis, and we know that we can do better there. Um, we are in the process right now of seeking a crisis communications consultant through an RFP process uh, to help improve our current operational plans where necessary and to provide additional strategic and executional capacity. Um, we definitely want to bring in uh, some fresh eyes to take a look at our operational plans as well. Uh, the second recommendation uh, germane to our department um, is recommendation 21. 
and that advises the city to routinely review and update a formal written operational emergency communications plan. Um, I'm here to say that our department has recently updated the public information communications annex to the emergency operations plan, and we will be enhancing this with a more formal notification tree for both internal emergency notifications to council, uh, enterprise leadership, and city staff, as well as for external public notifications. Um, those are such things that would specify the who should be notified, um, when should they be notified, and um, under what situational, uh, situa or under which situation. Um, I do wanna say that ultimately the cornerstone of our mission is being a trusted messenger, delivering timely, accurate, and verified information and messages um, is something that keeps our community safe. Um, it is something that we take very seriously. We know that trust was diminished and as a result, community experienced fear and at times did feel abandoned. That was brought out in the after action report. We are working hard to reestablish that trust with the diverse communities that we serve and we will continue to enhance and uh, improve our operational plans and we'll provide the testing and gaps analysis as we move forward. With that, I can stand for questions. Thank you, Council Member Osman. Uh, thank you, Madam and Vice President. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Vice President, and thank you, uh, Director R. Bergstrom. I appreciate you being here today. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation during the civil unrest and everything that was happening in the city of Minneapolis. What's your plan on um, combating that and, and kind of uh, making sure that misinformation is not getting to the a resident or finding a way to uh, correct that mistake. You know, we live in a democracy and people can say whatever they want on their, on their platform, but uh, misinformation uh, uh, can lead uh, the mistrust you sp spoke about. And also my second uh, question is uh, uh, many community members in our community, uh, English uh, is not their first language. Uh, what plan do you have, especially speaking uh, Somali and uh, Spanish, Hmong communities that live in the city of Minneapolis? What plan do you, does your department have uh, sharing that information with their language? Thank you, uh, Chair Palmasano, Councilmember Osman. Um, the answer to the first question, I think Chief Huffman mentioned an ecosystem, and I know uh, Director Lane has also mentioned the interlocking parts um, within NIMS. And so the Joint Information System or the Joint Information Center, if it stood up um, in person, um, actually uh, works to um, source that information um, and work together. So I think your first question was around the misinformation and how do we work. Um, we do need to work better. Um, this, the interlocking parts really need to function better so that we, uh, the joint information system needed to receive information in a more timely, uh, effective way. And I think that was one of the points that was brought out in the after action report is that this ecosystem of interlocking parts actually was not functioning um, as effectively as it could have. And so that's the work going forward over the next couple of years that we are presenting today. Um, the joint information system is only, um, will only be as effective as the information coming into the system. And so um, we are working uh, to make sure that we have identified PIOs. So for instance, making sure that the uh, police department PIO is fully stationed within the joint information system. Um, we actually have a new PIO uh, who joined city communications just two weeks ago um, and is somebody who actually was one of our external stakeholder partners that, that worked um, in the joint information system externally as well. And so um, by making sure that these um, interlocking parts are functioning, that we are making sure that we are verifying that information, which is part of what we do before the city actually puts any information out. Um, we work to make sure that we're verifying that. Um, in terms of your second question um, around um, translation, that translation w is handled through the community relations section of the joint information system. And so while not perfect, and um, we, we were working to, as we had messages that needed to go out to particular communities, 
we were working as well to translate those messages. And so we will definitely um, improve and enhance that as well and make sure that we have those um, translated um, service capacity and vendors um, standing by. Um, we are practiced in doing that and again, working with NCR, but um, we can always have more improvements to that as well. Thank you. Councilmember Chavez. <laughs> I had done this instead of the actual <laughs> chat. Thanks, uh, d uh, Director. I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what Councilmember Osman was talking about, and it's in regards to the translation services. I know that at least on Lake Street, when all this was happening, a lot of people formed group chats, so mm -hmm. communication online or press releases or communication. I think we would need to strategize differently for a lot of different community groups, at least for immigrants. I know communications like what I just mentioned is gonna be very difficult to communicate, whether it's language barriers or the way people access social media or communication, we need to be able sh to share th that we can strategize differently. And one thing that I know that happened is that people were getting on WhatsApp group chats mm -hmm. and that's how they were communicating in different languages when, pe when things were happening. And I was wondering if we have any strategies on how to approach um, communications that necessarily we wouldn't see as effective at the city level, but are actually effective mostly in our immigrant communities. Yeah, that. thank you uh, very much for that question, Chair Palmasano and Councilmember Chavez. Um, yes, that is part of our improvements, is to make sure that we are constantly up to date on the channels that we manage and making sure that we are identifying gaps. That is uh, an area of improvement as well. And um, we, as I mentioned, will be undertaking um, additional work in terms of social media to make sure that we have um, messaging that's that's flexible enough at the outset, but that we can plug and play the specific um, information that needs to get out to community and actually have that content translated. So that's actually something that I didn't mention, but I just was thinking about that before. So that that's ready to go at the outset of an incident um, as best that we can find and then put in the particular details um, at that time. So yes to all of that, we do need to improve. Thank you, thanks Chair. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Thank you, Director. Just have a quick question and actually building upon uh, Councilmember uh, Osmond's and Councilmember Chavez's uh, initial questions around um, information sharing with the community, but more specifically um, looking at how we address misinformation. I know one of the approach that, approaches that the city tried to utilize this time last year was um, potentially paying social influencers um, to help you know, provide or combat misinformation that got a lot of resistance. Just for public record, is that something that in our future communication strategies around you know, emergencies, um, is that something that we're still keeping on the table or did we kind of learn a lesson from a year ago and said we're, we're not gonna also use that as a maneuver to address misinformation? Uh, Chair Palmasano, Councilmember Wansley Warlaba, um, that is actually something that I have not um, thought about critically, you know, in the last uh, few months. That is definitely something that will be revisited to just take a look at how, you know, what channels do we have. We do work really closely with community stakeholders um, during times of crisis, again, through the community relations section of the joint information system, and again, with our neighborhood and community relations partners, and so that of which that effort um, you mentioned before. So we do strive to make sure that we are in community and working with community partners and that we are getting inf verified information um, to our partners through various channels, including directly, so that they can be um, timely because the goal is always to get the right information to the right people at the right time and we know, again, many gaps in that. Um, we will be working uh, closely with the rest of the enterprise through the interlocking parts to make sure that we're sourcing verified in sourcing and verifying the information and getting that out to community. So I would say that would be something we will look at as we are identifying um, improvements moving forward. Thank you, and just a quick follow-up to that. Um, on the other end, in terms of also verifying um, you know, the groups themselves, I know there was lots of concerns around what groups are being solicited or you know, selected in, in this effort to you know, relay information. Is there protocols of, of vetting 
um, as you're also considering, you know, community groups that you would like to bring into this process of sharing information with the public um, that, of course, once has been verified. But um, I know there was lots of concerns around the groups themselves, the selection process, the lack of transparency around that. Like even for council members, is there a way to get a, a you know, prior hand, a list of those partners that um, or community stakeholder groups that we do have relationships with that we consult for doing specific things like this? Yeah, Chair Palmasano, uh, Council Member, um, thank you for that question. Um, that would, we absolutely need to develop criteria if we were go to go forward on that. And so, yes, that would be something that you would be able to uh, see if that was going to go forward as well. There's also informal, um, I was speaking a little bit more to like the informal network of a community that we're in partnership with as well um, on the ground. So yes to making sure if that was a formal system um, to the transparency. So to clarify, there is an opportunity to standardize at least a, a criteria process. So, you know, whatever formal list that we have, it's been through a transparent standardized process. And maybe those that we do have informal connections with can be, you know, translated to this formal list. but. There is a, a open one. There's not. It sounds like a standardized like protocol or a process in place and vetting, but there is an opening to develop that. I, uh, Council member, yes, I believe there absolutely would be openings to develop that, um, and I would be happy to also go back to neighborhood and community relations and uh, find out the exact process right now and be able to report back as well. I'm not seeing any other questions or comments in queue. Um, I do want to just add in your presentation, you briefly uh, introduced him, but we do have the new Director of Public Safety Information yes. here with us, Howie Padilla. Welcome. Um, so um, that's already an improvement in <laughs> follow through of recommendations um, as we're moving forward. A quick question of something you had mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You mentioned doing an RFP for crisis communications. And yes. is that a preparatory measure or is that the idea of having somebody um, whose professional skills or expertise is entirely crisis communications on some sort of standby? Uh, Chair Palmasano, thank you. Um, yes, that is absolutely to make sure that we have um, uh, a robust um, set of uh, strategic eyes and ears and experts who are immersed in crisis communications on a you know week to week basis? Who have that experience uh, and depth of staff? Um, one of the things that we've identified is we just um, when a crisis unfolds, especially one that is of a sustained nature, we do have crisis communications expertise within the communications department and within the um, joint information system. The challenge is capacity. So it is enhanced capacity. Um, a second. Uh, outside perspective that can come in and help to, uh, you know, close some of the gaps that we have to provide additional content, for instance, um, and to make sure that we have that resource on standby on contract when needed. Because, of course, when you need it, it has to be ready. So, thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else. Thank you very much. Chair Palmasano, members of the council, um, I will bring us home here with the final recommendations, and these really are all kind of cross-cutting and involve multiple departments, and so I'm here to, to go through these final um, recommendations. Um, I'll deal with the first three recommendations because they're all related to really communicating with the community and um, the business community as well as our residents. Um, we've see, received feedback from the community in a number of different ways, and so we want to be very deliberate. Um, both we've received it formally through this reporting process, but also informally, as well as through other surveys that we have done. Um, we want to be very careful to evaluate the feedback that we have received so far, and then um, make sure that we're not, in fact, re-traumatizing the community as we go forward through the process. Um, we, and in that regard, we are having uh, the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department um, work to assess um, all the different areas that we've received feedback and kind of synthesize that together. And then we will work with city departments, and you see these listed here, all of the ones that you've heard from today, uh, to really recommend next steps. 
Um, as you know, CPED has been, the Community Planning and Economic Development Department has been out um, talking to businesses and offering them assistance as well. And so that has been active, active and so we will continue to look to see if there are gaps there. Um, you have heard from Director Bergstrom about specific areas of focus will include the improved sharing of information uh, with community, and so we'll be um, updating those recommendations as described by um, Director Bergstrom. Uh, the next, uh, the final recommendation is really with respect to curfew waivers. This is really um, going to be led by the city attorney's office. They will work with other folks. What we found was there weren't a lot of clear guidelines um, throughout the enterprise on granting curfew waivers when there was a curfew in effect. Um, and so there was a lot of confusion out there about who was granting these waivers, um, for what purpose. And so we need to really kind of clarify that. We will probably have to have some flexibility um, as we are not going to be able to identify every single situation where a curfew may be needed. Um, and so it'll be a little bit of a, um, a process to identify uh, what that kind of a policy would look like. Um, the city attorney is here today, obviously, and can answer some specific questions on that. With that, um, the mayor has directed us to uh, make sure that we are updating the council on a regular basis. We're planning on reporting to you quarterly on the process with respect to these recommendations and the progress um, with respect to the recommendations. So um, we are, as you heard, I mean, this was a very difficult situation um, during a, a global pandemic, uh, very unprecedented, but we are committed to improving on our response regardless. And we are here today to to make sure that we do that and to make sure that we're transparent and give you the information you need. So with that, um, that concludes our formal presentation. And if there are any additional questions, uh, we are here to respond. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. You know, it's incredibly important that we move forward to improve our response in emergency situations. And if there's one big theme of this whole after action review, it's that we have to be more coordinated as a city and you've demonstrated that in this presentation today. So thank you for everybody coming and presenting to us. We have a couple last questions or comments from, Wans from Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Chair Pomisano. Thank you, uh, Director. I just have a quick question. Is there a way to go back to your prior, the first slide? Because I thought I saw something on there about uh, constructive, oh, conversations. Okay. Um, of course, one of the top recommendations was also doing um, some type of community forms around the process. I understand the intentionality of re-traumatizing re-traumatization um, but of course we're in the process of still getting at the roots um, which is also you know th this is going to be traumatizing regardless um, because we haven't dealt with the roots of basically racial inequities at our city so just wanted to know if there's going to be proposals coming around how we can bring forward some structured community forms um, for the public to be able to just share kind of also their thoughts in response to this after action report, their experiences on the ground as well. I know we're getting that in a multiple, you know, uh, avenues that our neighborhood communities, you know, department is going to be leading up, but being very intentional if there's ways to just have some structured public hearings or forms for that work to, or that process to also happen. Uh, Chair Palmasano, Councilmember Wansley, Wall Wallaba, we, um, that will be part of what the neighborhood and community relations um, department will be evaluating, um, and so we will have more information on that um, in future reports. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you for your time. I will um, direct the clerk to file that report. Thank you. Uh, a reminder that item number four was removed from today's agenda. So next we will receive reports from the standing committees on matters that we will consider in the full council meeting this Thursday. We will begin with business inspections, housing and zoning. That committee is chaired by council member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The business inspections, housing and zoning committee is bringing 15 items forward for approval on Thursday. Items one, two, three, four, five, six and seven are all license applications. 
Item number eight is uh, granting an appeal with regard to a demolition of a historic resource. Item nine are the liquor license approvals and 10 are the renewals. Item 11 are the gambling license approvals. Item number 12 are income appropriations um, at, through the home and NSP program for the Minnesota Housing Impact Fund grant. Item 13 is a rezoning and a street vacation for the Northrop King building. Item number 14 is an issue with regard to the Upper Harbor Terminal. It has to do with a dock that was built in that location. And item number 15, perhaps the most notable item on the agenda, is reallocating millions of dollars for the acquisition and rehabilitation of emergency shelter for persons experiencing homelessness. I will just note um, that this is going to a number of very specific projects, including people serving people, um, as well as St. Anne's Place uh, and Simpson Housing. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on items 1 through 15. Thank you. Not seeing any, so we'll go on to intergovernmental relations. Uh, this meeting was chaired by Councilmember Rainville. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, the Intergovernmental Relations Committee has one item bring forward for approval at this week's uh, council meeting, uh, which is a passage of a resolution expressing unity with the people of Ukraine. You all have copies of that resolution. Uh, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Policy and Government Oversight Committee, chaired by Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Policy and Government Oversight Committee has 17 items to bring forward for approval at this week's council meeting. Item number one is the passage of a resolution for the 2022 quarterly donations reports. Item number two is the passage of a resolution for amending the 2022 general appropriations resolution for rollover of unspent 2021 appropriations. Item number three is accepting a bid for cleaning and lining of cast iron water mains. Item number four is accepting a bid for cooling coil replacement project. Item number five is accepting a bid for the A Street Southeast reconstruction project. Uh, item number six uh, is authorizing a uh, contract with uh, Gartner Inc. for IT research and advisory services. Item number seven is authorizing contracts to establish a language services pool for interpreting and translation services. Item number eight is authorizing a contract with uh, Enlight, DBA, Gen X, and Gen X slash Mitchell for workers' compensation, medical bill review, and bill payment services. I remember number nine is authorizing a uh, contract amendment with Privacy Strategy Group for Federal Representation Services. Item number 10 is authorizing contract amendment with Urban Ventures, Inc. for the Pathways Gun Diversion Program. Item 11 is authorizing the Skyway Agreement Amendment in relation to the Public Service Building. Item number 12 is authorizing the uh, issuance of requests for proposals for water meter reading hardware and software services. Item number 13 is approving a legal settlement for a workers' compensation claim of Daniel Dick. Uh, item 14 is authorizing uh, joint power agreements with the state of Minnesota to provide law, uh, law enforcement support for the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, item number 15 is authorizing contracts with the Corner House Interagency Child Abuse Evaluation and Training Center for forensic interview services of children and vulnerable adults. And item 16 is approving an appointment for the 2022 Local Board of Appeal and Equalization. Uh, item 17 is a staff direction in relation to the Public Safety Department Charter Amendment. And I will stand for any questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any. Uh, <laughs> Just in time, Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Oh. I just wanted to take a quick moment um, to discuss the Department of Public Safety uh, staff direction uh, that was raised in our committee just yesterday, especially since some of the information presented. I know, you know, members, uh, not everyone here is part of POGO, so just to provide some clarity on it. Um, so in bringing forth this uh, new de Department of Public Safety staff director, I'm really excited because it 
can actually help us create a new standard of uh, ethical and professional standards as regards to administering public safety services. Um, and also, as we just saw and discussed heavily in the presentation prior, it gives us the opportunity to repair the broken relationship between the residents as well as the city of Minneapolis. Um, I also know that there's lots of shared agreement that, you know, housing multiple programs within one department is also the best way for us to deliver uh, quality and ethical uh, public safety services. Um, but also what was very clearly raised in the presentation that we just um, heard, you know, there's lots of work that MPD um, is going to be leading and has to do in order to gain public trust and credibility. Um, and also we'll be hearing even more recommendations um, once the DOJ report comes out, the Department of uh, Human Rights uh, report as well. Um, and in that regard, so I'm looking forward to the mayor who has so authority over MPD to lead that work, and he's communicated um, his commitment to doing so. Um, but I also believe that, you know, for MPD uh, to be integrated in this department, it has to seriously uh, demonstrate compliance with many of the recommendations that's going to be coming forth that has already been named um, to seriously, you know, eliminate existing racial bias and violence that happens within the department. Um, I also believe that um, integrating MPD without DPS, without addressing deep structural and cultural changes will not be conducive nor helpful to MPD nor DPS, and also being successful in you know, meeting their goals of delivering these ethical and high quality services. Um, but also most importantly, I wanna name this, I believe integrating MPD into DPS immediately will also overturn the will of voters who made it clear in November that they want both MPD and an expansion of unarmed public safety services. And this directive affirms what the voters decided last November and allows council to finally take up action to create um, new public safety standards that goes beyond policing. So I'm really excited to see um, what our staff produces as a product of this directive. Um, I also um, added another component to this directive as we just you know, discussed uh, with the after action report is the need to bring the public along and having more dialogue about how we're moving forward around public safety services. So um, in the staff direction, um, we also include uh, a proposal to have a, a public comment period based off of the findings of that directive. Um, I also wanna name, I know I've been in conversations with some of our council members about doing interward events um, since public safety is such a, a major citywide issue and I would be more than happy to collaborate with any council member that's interested in doing further engagement around DPS and you know, in whatever po policing and public safety beyond policing can look like in our city. Um, so I just wanted to name um, some of those, those elements. I'm really excited to engage my own constituents further in the coming days and weeks around this um, amazing opportunity we have to really shape, um, reshape what public safety looks like. So Minneapolis is no longer known for the, uh, the egregious event that took place um, with the killing of Jamar, uh, not, well, Jamar is included in that. Um, it's been too many to name, but George Floyd specifically, um, and really doing a lot <laughs> more work to really build ourselves from the ashes of, of the uprising that took place following the murder of George Floyd. So I just want to raise those comments. Thank you to my colleagues for the vibrant conversation we had around this yesterday, yesterday and looking forward to having more conversations with you all in the coming weeks and months about this. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Public Safety Committee, P Public Health and Safety Committee, chaired by Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Health and Safety Committee has nine items to bring forward for approval at this week's council meeting. Number one is authorizing a contract amendment with the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension for Human Trafficking Investigations Crime Analyst Support. Item number two is authorizing a contract amendment with the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension for Human Trafficking Investigations. Item number three is authorizing submittal of a grant application to the Minnesota Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management to support the Office of Emergency Management's mission areas of prevention, preparation, mitigation, response, and recovery. Item number four is authorizing a submittal of a grant application to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for a Public Health Emergency Grant. 
Item number five is authorizing a practicum experience agreement with St. Catherine's University School of Social Work for internships. Item number six is accepting a Minnesota Department of Human Services grant for naloxone distribution. Item number seven is authorizing a health department master contract with one family, one community. Item number eight is authorizing a health department master contract with the neighborhood hub. And item number nine is authorizing a contract with the special school district number one, Minneapolis Public Schools for violence interrupter services. That concludes our business. Thank you. I don't see Council Member Wansley Warlaba. I just want to use this time to also give a shout out to uh, the amazing um, workers that we have in the uh, Civil Rights Department. Um, we got amazing presentation from our labor enforcement standards um, that talked a, a lot about some of the workers' rights policies that's been passed through um, council, one of which is wage theft. Um, and the presentation that we received gave a really good just, uh, you know, affirmation of, of the importance of co-governing. Um, specifically around uh, Blaze Pisa and my ward were two um, in the stadium, stadium area village. Um, you know, thanks to the diligence of our community partners over at Rock, Minnesota, uh, the city rights uh, department here, and the workers there, we were able to retrieve uh, up to $30,000 in stolen wages for those workers. So really excited that we got to amplify um, some of the, the best elements um, of policy work that we're doing here as it stands to support workers. So I just want to give a shout out to them and look forward to getting more presentations through PHS by, uh, about some of that great work that we're doing around labor enforcement standards. Thank you. Next, we have the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee. That committee this cycle was chaired by Council Member Koski. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee will be bringing forward 11 items. Uh, first is approving the 2022 Concrete Pavement Rehabilitation Program. Number two is approving the Glenwood Avenue North Street Reconstruction Project. Number three is approving the South Minnehaha Residential Street Resurfacing Project. Number four is appointments to the Bassett Creek Watershed Management Commission. Number five, appointments to the Shingle Creek Watershed Management Commission. Number six, agreement with Bassett Creek Watershed Management Commission for engineering services related to Bassett Creek Tunnel. Number seven, agreement with Bassett Creek Watershed Management Commission and Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board for a stormwater quality improvement project in Bryn Mawr Meadows Park. Number eight is Minneapolis Arbor Day Large Block Event Permit to be held on April 29th. Uh, number nine is Cinco de, Mayo, Cinco de Mayo Large Block Event Permit to be held on May 8th. Number 10 is a submittal of City of Minneapolis comments related to the E-Line Bus Rapid Transit Recommended Corridor Plan. Uh, at the council meeting on Thursday, I'll be bringing forward a motion to refer this item back to the Public Works Committee to allow additional feedback to be included in the comments from a community meeting that Metro Transit is hosting in Ward 3 this Saturday. And then number 11, 2021 annual reports and year end budget procedures for 15 special service districts. And at the council meeting on Thursday, I will be bringing forward an amendment to item 11 to correct an error to the annual budget for the Lindale Lake special service district. I'll stand for questions on any of these items. Thank you. I am not seeing any. Um, are there any other big items that we want to discuss this Thursday that we just want to call some attention to. Council President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did want to just note that um, this coming Thursday, we will be bringing back um, a proposal to create the working group to discuss rental stabilization. I know this is a really um, important topic that many of our residents are deeply concerned about, and so I want to make sure that folks know uh, while we postponed it one cycle um, to prepare um, a resolution, um, we will be bringing that forward this coming Thursday. And I'm not sure if Councilmember Chug Tai wants to comment as well. Yep, Councilmember Chug Tai. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and um, Council President Jenkins. Uh, you know, I've talked with a few of you uh, about this over the last few weeks, and I think there's just a couple of you that are left that, uh, you know, haven't had a chance to take a look at that uh, substitute motion that I'm planning on bringing forward and, and offer your comments and feedback. But um, we will be working on that uh, over the, the course of tomorrow, so have a chance to look at everything before it, it comes to Council on Thursday. Um, you know, based on conversations with the with the council president and with our staff and and our leadership, have been able to bring forward. Well, I'm planning on bringing forward a substitute motion on Thursday that, um, you know, presents an alternative path to us uh, moving on this policy and and putting it on the ballot in 2022 instead of 2023. Um, so excited to continue to have conversations with with all of you on on how we make that happen and. Um, to have a, a more thorough conversation about it on uh, on Thursday. Thank you. Also, we have a, an announcement from our city attorney, Mr. Router. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, just wanted to let uh, the council know that at city council meeting on Thursday, we'll uh, be uh, having a closed session to discuss, I believe, three pieces of litigation. Thank you. We will prepare for that. <laughs> um, with that, we've concluded all the business to come before the committee today. And seeing no objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.